Today we have three incredible speakers who will be talking to you about their research. We have Professor Mathieu Hua from the Department of Psychology, Professor Alana Watt from the Department of Biology, and Professor Cynthia Chang from the Department of Physics. So they'll be giving your, their uh, presentations, and once the presentations are completed, you will each receive a message from the host to join a breakout room. Uh, in this breakout room, you will be in smaller groups, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to each presenter and um, discuss with them about their, their work and their presentation. Each presenter will rotate through the rooms every 10 minutes until they've been in all of the rooms. We will then head back to this main uh, room as a full group for final remarks. So thanks again for coming and we will begin with Mathieu's presentation. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, oops, I'm trying to... Okay. Um, so today I'm going to uh, present you uh, some of the results of a recent experiment that we um, did uh, on uh, how our brain decides between uh, avoiding pain and obtaining uh, monetary rewards. So uh, according to philosopher Jeremy Bentham, our happiness depends on our capacity to minimize pain and maximize pleasure. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, that decision between uh, pain and pleasure can be uh, complicated by um, several health uh, uh, problems, um, especially chronic pain. So chronic pain is a very important uh, topic of research in our labs. Uh, and chronic pain patients constantly have to um, juggle uh, with uh, decisions involving um, pain and uh, competing uh, goals. So we wanted to know a little bit better how uh, our brains make these uh, very important uh, decisions between pain and rewards. Uh, and so in order to uh, do that, we designed this uh, task. Uh, so on top, you have the uh, example of an experimental trial. So each trial would start with a first offer. Half of the time it was money, half of the time it was pain. Uh, so for instance, in that particular trial, uh, offer number one is a monetary offer of uh, $7. Then after a brief uh, interval, the second offer would come up. Uh, so here in this case, the second offer was a uh, painful electric shock set to be at an intensity of 24 on 100 point scales. So basically, uh, for every trial, participants had to dis decide to accept or reject uh, compound offers of pain and money. For instance, would you be willing to accept a shock at level 24 in exchange for uh, $7.78? Um, when participants accepted the offer, they received the money, but also had to receive uh, uh, the electric shock. Uh, but if they rejected the offer, they avoided the shock, but uh, didn't receive the money. Uh, and by the way, we thank uh, all of our participants for uh, accepting to uh, play along with us and uh, do this uh, silly uh, experiment. Um, so here we can see an uh, um, example of uh, uh, the behavior of an exemplar participant. Uh, so we had several uh, levels of monetary offers, several levels of uh, pain offers, and on the left, we can see their decisions. So do you accept yes or no uh, the pain and money offer? On the right, uh, what we see is the result of a, um, a logistic regression model predicting the probability of accepting or rejecting the offer. And what was interesting to us here was that a green turquoise uh, zone there uh, in which um, pairs of points correspond to a 50-50% probability of accepting or rejecting the offers. So these 50-50 uh, points are called equivalence point and they really give us the, the value in dollar of that uh, pain level for that particular subject. Um, next, we um, uh, redid this uh, experiment uh, in an MRI uh, scanner, uh, and we um, trained an algorithm to predict uh, the offer number one. Okay, so uh, here 
what you can see on top, you can see the money predictive pattern. And the money predictive pattern um, was mostly comprised of positive weights in the nucleus accumbens, the brain's reward center. Uh, right below, you can see the pain predictive pattern. So uh, interestingly, it had uh, negative weights in the same region, the nucleus accumbens, uh, but it also had uh, uh, positive weights in other regions associated with uh, pain perception or uh, negative emotions, such as the primary somatosensory cortex, the periaqueductal gray matter, and the mid uh, uh, anterior cingulate cortex. Um, importantly, there seem to be a double dissociations between the two patterns. And this is what we see on the right here. So uh, the money pattern tracked money, but not pain, and the pain pattern tracked uh, pain, but not money. So the two representations could be dissociated. Uh, we were also curious to see if the pain predictive pattern um, was similar to uh, the pattern associated with the actual delivery of the shocks. So we trained a third uh, pattern to predict the intensity of electric shock based on activity uh, uh, related to delivery of the shock. Uh, this is the uh, shock uh, predictive pattern here. And although qualitatively it seemed like it um, might resemble the pain predictive patterns. We have positive weights here in the mid anterior cingulate cortex, periaqueductal gray matter. When we run a more uh, quantitative test, we saw that it could also be dissociated for, from uh, the uh, pain and money offer patterns. Um, so uh, finally, uh, we wanted to see if we could use these three different patterns to predict uh, actual choices uh, based on uh, activity observed during offer two. So we, uh, during offer two, we uh, computed pattern expression scores to see how much these different uh, uh, patterns that we had developed for offer one or for delivery of the shock to see how these different uh, patterns were expressed when participants were uh, making the decision during the offer two stage. Um, on the left here, we see the pattern expression scores for our uh, different patterns as a function of pain and money. Uh, so in red, we have the pain pattern. In green, we have the money pattern. And in orange, we have the shock pattern. And in blue here, we uh, simply computed the difference between the pain and money pa uh, patterns. Uh, and right there, we can see that the that difference closely resembles participants' uh, behavior. Uh, so it seemed like we could use that information to predict uh, the choices during the offer two stage. Uh, and this is uh, what we have here on the right. So we uh, trained another algorithm to combine uh, the three different patterns to uh, predict uh, choices during offer two. And what we saw was that uh, the combination of the three patterns, so money, pain, and shock, uh, was the most uh, successful in predicting participants' choices, uh, and it was relatively uh, accurate. So here we had an accuracy between 0.7 and 0.75. So um, essentially, this tells us that the brain is using these different uh, uh, distributed patterns of activity to uh, make those important decisions between uh, pain and pleasure. Um, and so I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my uh, colleagues, uh, students, and also funding agencies. Thank you. Okay, unmuted now. Uh, thanks, Mathieu, for your presentation. Our next speaker is Alana Watt from the biology department. Great, thank you. Um, just going to try to find my slides. Uh, sorry, here we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, great, thanks very much. I'm gonna talk today about a project we have going on um, in the lab um, called Exercise in a Pill for Ataxia. And Though I'm just going to show you, this is a picture of the main campus, and the Watt Lab is located in the life sciences complex. Um, so one of the projects that we look at in the lab is trying to understand a disease called spinocerebellar ataxia type 6, 
or SA6. So ataxia is a form of motor uh, coordination, um, um, it's a motor coordination disease. And this is really um, it characterized by a kind of progressive uh, degeneration. So people get worse and worse and typically end up uh, wheelchair bound. And we know from postmortem human uh, tissue studies that this affects the cerebellum, the little brain at the back of the brain, and that this, um, in particular in the cerebellum, there are particular types of cells that die. So we're really understand, interested in understanding how this happens so that maybe we can reverse it. Um, but we don't study ataxic patients, we study a mouse model of ataxia. And um, this mouse model recapitulates a lot of what we see with human patients. So the mice are initially have, don't have motor symptoms, and then they develop midlife and get progressively worse. And the cells that die don't die until quite late in the disease. And in fact, there are other cellular changes earlier on. And we're really interested in trying to understand, identify those changes and find ways of reversing them. And when I say we, who I mean, actually, this project was started by a former PhD student, Shriram Jabal, and has been continued by a current PhD student, Anna Cook. So most of this work is Anna's. Um, so one thing that we know um, from human um, studies is that BDNF is, re is uh, reduced in a toxic in SA6 brains, in SA6 cerebellum, in fact. So what's BDNF? Well, this is a growth factor that's important during development, but also is thought to be important throughout the lifespan um, of a person or of an animal. So you can think about it a little bit like the a fertilizer for the brain. So we wanted to see if BDNF was also reduced in our mouse SA6 brains, and in fact, we found that to be the case. I'm just showing here a picture, but we've also quantified that, and I'll show you that in a minute. So you can see that BDNF is reduced. So that's interesting. We then wondered, can we increase BDNF in the brain? And there's actually a, a long literature showing that this, in fact, is possible. So there's good evidence that exercise increases BDNF levels in other brain regions. It hasn't really been studied in the cerebellum very much. So to, want, to look to see whether this might be potentially um, a therapeutic strategy in SCA6, we gave our mice um, either a locked running wheel or a running wheel that was um, freely moving. And mice really like to run, and so they run enthusiastically over the course of a month. And then we looked at BDNF levels, and I'm showing this at work was actually done by an undergrad who works in our lab, a current undergrad, Jackie Sheng. And this is showing you some of the quantification that we do. So if we look in the gray bars, that's WT means wild type, which is what we can we call our control mice. So BDNF levels are not changed by exercise in our control mice. The red uh, bar shows you that in the SA6 mouse, BDNF levels are in fact lower. And when we exercise the mice for a month, we see a partial uh, elevation of BDNF, not all the way back to our control levels, but it's moving in the right direction. So we wondered, does there, is there some sort of behavioral consequence to this? And so to look at that, we used an assay called Rotorod. And Rotorod allows us to, to, to kind of assay the motor coordination of a mouse. If you've ever seen the log driver's waltz um, from the National Film Board, um, you kind of have an idea of what a rotor rod is. And if you haven't, I really encourage you to go and look at this. This is like a slice of Canadiana and it's very cute. Um, so when we do this kind of assay, we see, um, so again, I'm showing you black and gray bars are showing your control mice and we don't see that exercise changes their performance on this rotor rod. The SA6 mice in red are doing really poorly, but when we exercise them, we see a rescue. 
So that's great um, and very positive. But of course, with the disease where people um, are developing progressive ataxia, exercise might not always be um, that beneficial or, or that possible. So we wondered if we could mimic BDNF, mimic exercise. And in fact, there's a known molecule that does that, that, that activates the same signaling pathways as BDNF. And so we gave mice this drug, which is called DHF, and we we're able to show on the rotor rod that this causes a reversal in ataxic symptoms. So this is very promising uh, as a potential therapeutic strategy for SCA6 um, patients. And finally, I just want to thank the people who did the work who I've tried to highlight throughout the talk and also my funding sources. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks to you, Alana, for that interesting presentation. Our final speaker will be Cynthia Chang from the Department of Physics. All right, thanks. I'm, uh, let's see. Okay, so I think I will ask uh, Preeti, are you still pulling up the PDF? Okay, perfect. Um, let me just enter full screen. Okay, great. All right, uh, well, thanks for um, tuning in to listen to us today. Uh, my name is Cynthia, and I'm going to tell you about what I do for my work. Um, so I'm a cosmologist. And uh, so let me explain to you what that is. Um, so in cosmology, we are interested in studying um, the big, quest big questions about the universe. Um, there's a bit of a delay. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we're interested in studying the history and the evolution and the structure of the universe on its largest scales. And so what this means in practice is that we are interested in answering questions like, sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, um, the, the slides are flicking ahead uh, uh, ahead of me, so let me just wait for it to go back to where I was. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so the kinds of questions we're interested in asking are things like, how and when did the universe begin? What is the fate of the universe? And what is the universe made of? Uh, these are pretty big questions that humans have been asking themselves for as long as we've existed. And one of the wonderful things about cosmology is that with the development of precision instrumentation, we can actually begin to answer these questions in quantitative and scientific ways um, by building specialized telescopes. So this picture that I have here, um, if the slide comes up without too much of a delay, um, is a cartoon diagram of the observable universe as we currently understand it. Uh, so we as the observers are sitting in the center and the shells that you see radiating outward represent different epochs of the universe's history going back in time. So the farther out you look, the farther back in history we're looking. And our job as cosmologists is to piece together this picture um, one step at a time. So the way that we do that um, is that the universe has given us a gift, um, which is in the form of hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and it has a very special property in that it glows um, at radio frequencies. And so the one sentence punchline um, is that we can literally listen to the history of our universe by tuning our radio telescopes to the appropriate wavelengths. Um, so that's the basic idea. And so then the next question is, how do we actually do this in practice and the answer is that there's, um, there's good and bad news. Uh, so the good news is that radio waves are pretty easy to detect um, in some sense. Um, everybody has a radio receiver, um, so you can do radio cosmology. It's, it's not that hard. Um, but there's a catch, um, which is that if you try to do this from home, you will pick up your favorite FM radio stations and you will not hear anything from the sky because it will all be drowned out um, by all of the radio stations and other sources of interference um, that are generated by people. Uh, so, so that's not good. Um, but as scientists, we try to find solutions for these things. Uh, so there is a solution, uh, which is to leave civilization behind. Um, so one of the more recent aspects of my research that I started in the past year um, is a program that is being done from uh, the middle of nowhere um, in the high Arctic. Uh, so we are very fortunate that McGill operates an Arctic research station at 79 degrees north. Um, you can see it's uh, that little yellow marker um, on Axel Heiberg Island in Nunavut. 
Um, so my team and I went there for the first time last year and we are starting to install antennas to try to explore the earliest parts of the uh, universe's history. Um, so for the last few slides, I'll just show you some glamour shots of what it's like to do this work in practice. Uh, so this was our team that went last year. Uh, was myself on the left and Taj Dyson, who is an undergraduate in the middle, and Raul Monsalve, who is a research associate on the right-hand side. And uh, we just, you know, went off with all of our stuff. So about half of our bags is scientific equipment and the other half is food to keep us, uh, you know, fueled for while we're doing our data collection. And um, one of the wonderful things about um, observational cosmology is that we get to design and build all of the instruments ourselves. And by we, I mean my brilliant students, um, not me, I just do paperwork these days. Um, and in particular, I wanted to point out uh, Taj Dyson in here um, is the first undergraduate who joined my group. And I actually met him at the first soup and science talk that I gave in 2018. Uh, so if any of you in the audience are interested in you know, joining us for these adventures, uh, drop me a line, it's a lot of fun. Um, so this picture, um, if the slide comes up, um, is the first antenna that we installed in the high Arctic. And this is the start of a multi-year program uh, that is just starting off now. Uh, so there's lots of work cut out for us and we will be trying to unlock the secrets of the early universe. Um, so I'll end uh, just by saying that um, you know, radio cosmology is a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of uncharted territory in the universe's history that we are still, still trying to figure out. And again, um, by literally tuning our telescopes to the right, light, right wavelengths, uh, we can listen into various slices of history and fill in that picture that I showed. Um, but the most important aspect of this is that the work is tremendously fun um, because we have um, fun science questions, uh, we get to work with our hands and build instruments and go on crazy adventures. Um, so I'll end there. And if anyone uh, has any questions, drop me a line in one of the chat rooms afterwards. Thanks.